today we're taking a look at kibbeh, one of the best appetizers in Middle Eastern cuisine. These fried croquets are miles ahead of their European counterparts, and they're made with a beef and bulgur casing. It results in a super crunchy texture that's just so satisfying to eat. Once prepared, they can be frozen ahead of time, then cooked and served within a few minutes. They're a super convenient food, and they taste absolutely fantastic. If you're new here, I'm Obi. I live for the crunch and I want to get you cooking amazing Middle Eastern food at home. Kibbeh is one of those dishes that just seems like a lot of work, but in reality, it's not that difficult to make. These classic kibbeh are filled with a lightly spiced lamb and onion filling, and there are other fillings out there for you to discover. They make for an amazing appetizer that is very popular during Ramadan, and frankly, they're so worth the effort involved. You lot have been asking for this for a while, so let's get right to it. First thing we'll do is make the filling that we'll be putting in the kibbeh. This is the most common type of filling used, and it's basically minced lamb that's been cooked with onions. To start, I've placed a pan on the stove over medium heat, and I'm adding in one tablespoon of butter. Let this melt completely, and then add in 50 grams, or one and three quarter ounces of pine nuts. These will add a nice nutty texture to the filling, and you want to toast these to a light brown color. Keep stirring these in the butter, and after about three minutes, they will be fairly golden and toasted. Remove immediately from the pan and let them drain on a paper towel lined plate. Next, clean out the browned butter from the pan and place it back on the stove over a medium high heat and add in another tablespoon of butter. Once it's mostly melted, add in two brown onions, which you'll need to chop to a medium small dice. Mix these with the butter, then allow them to saute for about eight minutes. Stir them occasionally and they should turn this translucent color. Once they've completely softened, push them to one side of the pan so we can add in the minced lamb. You'll need 500 grams or just over one pound of minced lamb and press it down into an even layer. If you can't get minced lamb, beef will work instead, but you need this with a 20% fat ratio, which will keep the filling really moist. Turn the heat up to high and allow this to cook undisturbed for about five minutes. When the five minutes are over, break the meat up into a few smaller pieces and flip them over. They should have browned nicely and you can now break the meat up into small pieces. Use the back of a wooden spoon to chop the meat up into tiny pieces and then mix it with the sautéed onions. After that we'll add the seasonings. One teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of sumac, half a teaspoon of black pepper and about a quarter teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg. Mix this all together into the meat until well combined, then continue breaking up the meat into even smaller pieces. After about three to four more minutes, the meat should be well cooked and you want to add your toasted pine nuts back to the pan. Mix this together really well and you should have something that looks like this. Remove the meat from the pan and set it aside to cool. The other major component of kibbeh is the casing and this is basically a dough made from bulgur and meat. It might be weird to use meat in a dough, but it essentially binds the bulgur together to form a paste and the bulgur is what gives the kibbeh its great texture. If you haven't used bulgur before, it's these small pieces of cracked brown wheat that resemble sand. They have a great texture when cooked, and you'll probably recognize it from a Lebanese tembula. For this recipe, you'll need 500 grams of fine or extra fine bulgur. You don't want to use coarse bulgur here, as it just won't bind together the same way. Add 500 milliliters or 17 fluid ounces of cold water to the bulgur and mix them together. Once mixed, let the bulgur sit and absorb the water for about 30 minutes. While that's absorbing, take one large or two medium onions and chop them up into a rough large dice. These will be ground into the bulgur later on. Now we'll take a look at the meat, and this weird blob is 250 grams or nine ounces of minced beef. It's 0% fat and it's been very finely ground. Ignore the color, it's just oxidized a little. The beef has been minced extremely fine and it resembles a paste rather than regular minced meat. You'll probably need to get this from a butcher, and when you do, make sure they remove all gristle, fat, and silver skin. They should put it through the fine mincer three times to get it to this texture. I have a mincer and did it off camera myself, and you can see just how paste-like it must be. Once the 30 minutes are up, this is what my bulgur looked like. It has absorbed all the water and it now resembles wet sand. Break it up with your fingers into smaller pieces and set it aside. To make the casing, I'm going to be using a mincer attachment for my stand mixer. It's the best tool you can use and it produces a fantastic texture, but if you don't have one, you can use a food processor instead. I'll start by adding the bulgur to the mincer, 
and for this first run, I'm just going to pass it through by itself. You'll see that the bulgur clumps together in the mincer, and it comes out looking like strands of fresh pasta. If you don't have a mincer, then I'd try kneading the bulgur on a work surface until it starts to clump up. Halfway through mincing the bulgur, add your roughly chopped onion into the mincer, and this will get transformed into a paste. As an alternative, you could put these in a blender. Continue processing the bulgur until the whole thing has gone through the mincer. To season the bulgur, add 2 teaspoons of salt, 1 teaspoon each of black pepper, boharat and sumac, and half a teaspoon of cardamom powder. Next, add in a quarter of a teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg, and then mix everything together until roughly combined. Take that mixture and add it back into the mincer, and let it all pass through once more. As an alternative, add it to your food processor, but only let it run for about a minute. When done, this is what the bulgur looks like. At this point, you want to incorporate the mincemeat with the bulgur, and this is why it's so important for the meat to be a paste. Mix it together really well until it looks like one uniform colour and texture. We'll pass this through the mincer, which will make it turn into a paste, and you could use your food processor again for this step. When done, this is what I was left with. You can see it's all one homogeneous texture, and if you take a bunch, you can roll it into a perfectly smooth ball. You might not be able to get it this smooth without a mincer, but it will still work and taste good. We're now ready to shape the kibber and make them into their classic rugby ball shape. To start, I've taken the casing and weighed it out into 35 gram pieces. Wet the palms of your hand with some water and then roll a weighed piece in your hands until it forms a perfect sphere. The water is there to make the casing easier to manipulate. If you find it starts cracking, then you should add a little more water to the ball. I'd recommend weighing out all the balls and rolling them before you start filling. To shape, I'll take a ball of casing and once again, I'll add a little water and mix it into the casing. Then to hollow it out, I push my finger into the center of the ball until it can almost touch through to my other palm. I use my finger to compress the casing between my palm and my finger while constantly rotating, and this causes the casing to be formed into a hollow dome or cup. Make sure not to make a complete hole through this as you don't want a donut, and you basically want to get the casing to about two to three millimeters thick on all sides. When it resembles a cup, add in a tablespoon of the filling to the centre of the casing, and then fold all the sides over the filling. It's key here that you get a complete seal over the topping, so pinch all the sides together and then roll it in the palms of your hands. Form it into an oblong shape, then using your fingers smooth either end out, and stretch them into a slightly pointy tip. And that's how you shape the kibba. An easier way to do this is to use a small cup or espresso glass and line it with some plastic wrap. Add your moistened ball of casing to the glass and then once again put your finger in the centre of the ball. Now press it into the side of the glass, rotating again until you've gone all the way around and have something that looks like this. Now just add the filling in, then pull the plastic out of the glass. Press the sides of the casing together until it seals, then remove it from the glass and roll it into the oblong shape. If any holes form, just pinch them shut and don't forget to add the signature pointy tip to either end or as my wife does, just one side. Do the same until you've used up the casing or all the filling, and this recipe should make about 36 pieces. Last thing you should do is put these on a plate or tray and place them in the freezer for about 30 to 60 minutes until they just about firm up. I had to stack mine on top of each other due to limited freezer space. Then I unfortunately forgot and left them for two days, which caused them to stick together. Don't do this. The correct thing to do is once they're firmed up, place them in a Ziploc bag, and then return them to the freezer to completely freeze through. These will stay good in the freezer for more than six months, so it's great to make a batch and have it on hand for a quick meal. Cooking the kibba is quite simple. All we need to do is deep fry them. You can try air frying or baking them, but I doubt you'll get the same texture. Remove your pieces of kibba from the freezer about 50 minutes before cooking, and let them rest at room temperature. Take a medium sized pot and add about 1 litre of frying oil to it. Turn the heat up to high and you want to bring the oil to between 160 to 170 degrees Celsius or 320 to 340 Fahrenheit. I'd recommend using a thermometer to help you monitor the temperature. And when it gets there, turn the heat to medium and add in 2 to 3 pieces of frozen kibba. Once in there, roll the kibba around in the pot and this just helps to firm up the outer layer of casing. I like to continue rolling them around in the oil and they need to cook for four minutes. 
Obviously, if you have better temperature control, you can add more pieces in at a time, but make sure not to overcrowd the pot. After four minutes, they'll have developed this deep brown color, and that's when you need to pull them out of the oil and allow them to drain. Place them on a paper towel lined plate, which will catch any excess oil and let them drain for a few minutes. Now all that's left to do is plate up the kimba and serve them while hot. These are usually served as an appetizer, so just arrange them with some parsley or coriander and a side of tahini or garlic sauce. The outside of the kimba should be fully dry and crispy like this. Now let's check out the inside of the kibba. After not having homemade kibba for years, this recipe is definitely a game changer. I plan on keeping some in the freezer so I can grab a quick meal whenever. And you didn't hear this from me, but these things are even better than falafel in a sandwich. Now let's check out the taste test. Now that is what I call a satisfying bite of food. The exterior is extremely crispy and crunchy, while the interior contains soft and tender meat. It's very much a food of contrasting textures, and I think that's what makes kibba so great. They're probably one of the most convenient Middle Eastern foods to cook, and I'll be stocking my freezer with a bunch more of these for Ramadan. Go ahead and try these if you've never heard of them, and I promise you won't regret it. Thank you for watching, and be sure to click the like, share and subscribe buttons to help us spread the good word. If you make kibba, be sure to send us some photos on Instagram. As always, thanks to our Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you like the recipe and want to help us make more, then consider becoming a patron. The link and recipe are in the description box down below, and I'll be back next week with another recipe.